Hello and welcome to this Alumni Insight event. It's wonderful to have so many of our students and graduates with us this evening for what I'm sure will be a fascinating insight into the world of television and beyond. I'm Andrew Fletcher. I'm a lecturer in journalism at the University of Salford and I also report and present for ITV Granada Reports, the regional news programme for North West England. Thank you very much for joining us on Zoom this evening as much as we would have loved to have hosted this event on campus in one of our lecture theatres. The fact that we are hosting this event virtually does mean that we have the pleasure of welcoming attendees from all over the world, as well as two of our speakers who have logged in this evening from Egypt and the USA. As a university, we are committed to providing the best possible support for our students and graduates as you progress in your lives and careers. We hope this event will give you a unique insight into how to get your foot in the door in the world of TV and beyond and give expert tips on networking, reaching out to the right people and building confidence. You can also find a host of information as well as fellow Salford graduates with whom you can explore online mentoring and networking opportunities on our exclusive alumni hub from Salford.com. Now in a moment, I'll be inviting Rob to speak Following Rob's talk, we will open the floor to questions. Uh, so do be thinking of your questions and you can ask those in the Q&A uh, panel, which you should be able to see on your screen. Uh, we'll be joined for the Q&A by uh, two members of our alumni community as well, Hanan and Nick, uh, both of whom graduated recently and are already doing exciting things in the media, uh, as well as from Paula, who is our resident careers and enterprise expert. And they'll be helping Rob to answer your questions uh, you'll, so you'll hear advice from a range of voices this evening. So please do post any questions you have in the chat over the course of the session and we will get through as many of them as we can. First though, I'm delighted to welcome Rob Bagshaw. Rob is joining us from Los Angeles to tell us how he forged a career spanning over 20 years in unscripted television. Rob, who is a Salford graduate, began his career working on This Morning and The Big Breakfast and in more recent years has moved to the US to head up many successful reality shows as executive producer at Bunim Murray Productions and currently Nickelodeon Family, working alongside superstars from RuPaul and the Kardashians to SpongeBob SquarePants. So Rob, thank you so much for joining us from California. We're really looking forward to hearing what you have to say this evening. I will hand over to you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thanks. First thing I wanna say is welcome to everybody and thank you so much for taking the time to jump on another Zoom call. Um, it still doesn't get easy, right? Just because we're used to doing this, it's still a very strange experience not to be in a room together. Um, working in television, it is really hard to kind of create content when you are uh, separated like this. But I guess, not. I hate saying silver lining when it comes to these situations, but the nice thing is we can speak to everybody from all over the world. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. And thanks again for, for joining us. Um, I saw the theme for, for this particular sort of conversation. And I really want to make this as practical um, and productive as possible. So I thought the, the best way I can do this is in, really in two parts for the, the few minutes that I have here. Um, why take advice from somebody that you don't know or who graduated like 20 plus years ago um, unless you know sort of where they came from and, and what they've done so rather and um, my first part here is a, is a little bit of a quick bio uh, of uh, how I got out to LA and, and, and working in, in uh, television and, and media but through uh, the milestones of how I got those kind of big jobs um, because the subject here is how to network, how to get ahead, how to get the gig. So rather than just spiel off the bio, I thought I would use um, the milestone moments to say how I got to the next step. Um, then once you know who I am and how I got there, we can then get into a bit of practical advice. And I have sort of three or four sort of big points um, that certainly you know, reminded me of how to, how to move forward in my career. And hopefully that's helpful to you. Um, so here's the bio. Um, I graduated from Salford in 1995. Um, I have to say, the in, certainly no social media, and it wasn't really uh, the inter internet. I mean, I know it had been invented, but it certainly wasn't available in the way that it is now in terms of 
communicating with people, researching about what's available out there. Um, you know, back in the day, and I really feel like I'm going to age myself, you know, the newspapers were where you got a lot of your information. And the Guardian had a section called the Media Guardian uh, every Monday at the back of the newspaper, literally job ads at the back of the paper. It seems so old fashioned now to, to say that. So that's what I did when I graduated is I scoured the newspaper for as many jobs as possible. I was lucky in some ways in the producing was what I was most interested in. I think when we all started at, at my course, uh, the BA Media and Performance course, we came in all wanting to be performers because we didn't really know much about the industry other than that. And when you're a kid, that's what you want to do, right? Um, and then we all came out learning, having learned you know, different areas of, of the business. And so I was kind of singularly minded in terms of uh, being a producer. Didn't really know what that meant in terms of, um, you know, I'd had some work experience at Granada, Granada News of all places, um, but uh, didn't really know what a producer does. I just knew that that's what I wanted to do somehow. Uh, so I was applying for every producer gig that was listed. I applied for something called an event producer, um, because it had the word producer in the title. And it wasn't until I got to those first few stages of those interviews, that I was like, oh, that's not television. That's like producing events for companies. I don't want to do that. So we made a, I made a lot of mistakes. But my first big job was working for an agency um, as an assistant agent uh, in London. That job came from the Media Guardian. Um, and as a result of that, I got exposed to working professionals in film, television and theater. Um, comedians doing stand-up tours, actors on soap operas, um, lots of West End, you know, performers working eight shows a week. And a few of those were very well known. So they were going off to America to do movies. So as an assistant agent, photocopying scripts, uh, overhearing deals, connecting, you know, agents and producers uh, with our talent, I kind of got a huge range of of the business, literally the business, like working in different um, sort of areas of those, you know, those genres. Um, and we're still sort of interested in performing, couldn't work out whether I should be in front of the camera or behind the camera. And as a result of still looking for interesting jobs, I was offered a performing gig, uh, you know, working on a cruise ship. Um, but one of the, uh, the people that we represented at the agency had a production company called Hattrick Productions um, and offered me a, a running job, a, a PA job, a runner's job on a sitcom. One was lots of money. Uh, that was the cruise ship. One was zero money. It was like 90 pounds a week uh, working on this sitcom for BBC Two. I took the sitcom. Uh, and as a result of that, I was uh, a PA at Hattrick for two years, which I think is unheard of now. People do like running gigs or PA gigs for like a week and then they want to be an executive producer. But I was a PA for two years and I literally went from one of their shows onto the next show, onto the next show. And they were doing dramas on location, studio, game shows, entertainment shows, music shows, all kinds of different genres. Um, and so for two years, I got uh, exposed to that. I was offered a junior researcher job, which is kind of the very small next level up from being a runner. So I was researching for the host of a talk show, Clive Anderson, if anybody remembers him, and uh, researching all of the guests that came on the show. So I was slowly getting into the business and lucky enough I feel now to work up tiny tiny ladders uh, or steps on a on a ladder from junior researcher to researcher that's how I got the big breakfast I mean there's a few other shows in between here but the big breakfast was a good milestone because it was such an education I know it's coming back uh, for the Black Lives Matter events on on channel four which is awesome um, but it was an anarchic show and uh, even the executive producers were similar age to kind of the junior producers we were working super hard because the hours were almost 24 seven. It's a two hour live show where you have maybe 40 or 50 items. Nothing is longer than three minutes. It's totally stupid. You know, while you're drinking in the pub the night before you might've come up with a silly game. Suddenly it's a, it's a fun title. It's a pun. If anyone remembers that show, puns were the thing. So um, you got the opportunity to try out your silly idea live on television. And if it worked, it became a regular item. That was a uh, really good training ground, I have to say. Um, and as a result of doing a lot of live TV, again, in between other shows, I got This Morning, which at that point was hosted by Richard and Judy. Um, and I started as a day producer, just responsible for one episode a week. It took a whole week to prepare that episode. You do your three hour plus live show. 
Um, and then the next morning you start preparing for, for the following week. So I started as a day producer and again, you know, just worked my butt off, pushed, pushed, pushed ideas that they hadn't done before got heard no, 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 all of the time. And then somehow I kind of won the crew around to trying out these you know, nutty ideas um, and ended up you know, taking over the series and then being in the, the control room for every episode, five days a week and having uh, the day producers report to me. So all of that to say live experience uh, was a real privilege and you don't get to do that, certainly not in the States as much as, uh, as I would like to, um, but a lot of crazy stuff happens when you're live. Um, you prepare as much as possible um, and then live on the show, news flashes, assassination attempts, drunk rock stars, uh, streakers, um, all kinds of crazy stuff happens uh, and you deal with it as best you can in the moment, staying very calm. Um, and then you laugh about it, you know, afterwards uh, and you take that life experience on for when the next crazy thing happens. Um, at some point, I was working for uh, Mentor Media uh, in London and we had the opportunity to pitch uh, a new reality show that I was developing uh, to Fox in America. And I was asked to come out and join the pitch. We pitched to Channel 4 and to Fox at the same time and Fox picked up the show. So I came out to LA to help set up the US arm of the company um, and was expecting to stay for three weeks uh, to cast the show, crew up the show. And of course, you know, stayed on the production. The series did well. We got a second series and I ended up not coming back to the UK for nine months. Uh, we did two seasons in one. And that's really another milestone that got me into US production. And then for the next few years, I was back and forth from US to the UK. Uh, producing various shows. I went on holiday to Australia while I was on holiday uh, because I'm that guy. I still was contacting people asking uh, if I could come talk to them about various things. I went in to see a network in Australia during my vacation just to say hello um, and meet the head of uh, programming there. And then a few months later, got a call saying that we would like you to come and teach us how to make reality competition shows. I was doing Big Brother, Survivor, Dancing with Stars, I'm a Celebrity, all of those things. Um, and so I went to Australia for two and a half years to run entertainment for a network there. Um, while I was doing that, I had an agent in America as a result of those US shows that I was um, that had been packaged um, and that I was working on. So I had a relationship with a big agency in the States. And that's usually how those sort of jobs come about by having representation at this point. Uh, and my agent said, why are you in Australia working for a network? We can bring, come back to LA, we can get you those sort of jobs here. So I moved to LA permanently uh, 10 years ago and has work, have worked as a, a showrunner, as we call it here, um, uh, an executive producer being in charge of the day-to-day -day of one particular show. And I just moved from show to show to show. Um, and as a result of that, had the opportunity to stay in-house at a couple of production companies. So the BBC have a production unit out here. I was doing a series for them and they asked me to oversee all of the showrunners for all of our shows, including Dancing with the Stars, which was a big hit in the States, the US version of Strictly. Um, and then went to Burnham Murray, as Andrew mentioned, um, and did a lot of reality shows, celebrity access, uh, docu-series and competition shows. Those things take a lot of development uh, and we were pitching 30 or 40 of those and getting three or four, you know, green lit and overseeing those. Um, and then I moved from that into working for a, um, for a network. Uh, I was lucky enough to join Nickelodeon, which is a big kids and family network in the States, been around for 40 years. Um, but our audience are four years old, so they don't know that. Um, so we were constantly reinventing, uh, especially the last couple of years, um, the type of programming that we do at Nick. And I have to say, during a pandemic, doing shows for kids and families, which I hadn't really done before, was a total privilege, um, really helped us connect as, uh, as people first, which I'll come on to, um, and, uh, and do some really important programming, you know, for the next generation. So that's how I got to where I am. And I hope I've referenced how I got each of those milestone jobs, because that sort of brings us on to what everybody I hope really wants to know is how do I get the gig that I really want? So these are my kind of notes here. Um, the first thing I wanna say is uh, about reaching out. Always reach out. 
Uh, I've heard friends have been told this from, from their bosses. I've certainly been told this from, from people who have more experience than I in the business. Sure, reach out, always reach out. Uh, but don't assume that somebody else will take the initiative. People are super busy. You know, we're all wrapped up in our own worlds. We need to be reminded now and again. So just because you've had a great connection or a moment with somebody doesn't mean that they're going to remember it, you know, down the line. So there is nothing wrong with uh, just knocking on that door, you know, shooting them a DM, sending them an email, trying to get them on the phone. Um, and, you know, just that, that moment of, you know, how many times you think, uh, oh yeah, I remember that person, but it's not often until they're directly in front of you again that you're like, let's do this. You know, it's definitely sort of right time, right place. So the other thing I wanna say is be open to something that isn't exactly in your wheelhouse. If you've got an idea of where you want your career to go and it's like, okay, I'm super organized. I've got step one, step two, step three. You know, you're missing some of the great opportunities where you can connect with other people or you're gonna find something that you enjoy more or you're gonna get some experience that is gonna get you to the, to the next level. So you never know who you're gonna meet or what'll come from just kind of saying yes to something, even if you don't think it's exactly what you're planning. I'm gonna come back to that. Um, the other thing I wanna say is, uh, is to spread the love. Um, as you can tell, I'm still super passionate about what I do. I love uh, television and uh, all of the media that comes around TV these days because we you know, produce content for all kinds of platforms. There's nothing wrong with showing your enthusiasm. You know, we see so many people who are actually working, you know, on a day to day basis, even professionals who are like, oh, it's another gig. Uh, I'm here for the paycheck, you know, whatever it is. Um, there's nothing wrong with being passionate about what you do. And generally you stand out from the crowd if you are like that. So I've always thought if you're a fan of someone or a fan of something, and I don't mean like a super fan, like a guilty pleasure, or oh, that celebrity I love. I mean, a fan of their work or a fan of the show in, in terms of your career of something that you would like to be doing. Nothing wrong with showing that enthusiasm. I will say though, it's got to be in context with the conversation that you're having with them. You can't just bombard them at dinner. Um, but if you're sending them a note, you've got to say why you're passionate about the reason that you want to make contact with them. You can't look like a crazy fan because you know that's not good for anyone. Um, I'm going to break my own rule here because I know I always get a bit long winded because I'm so passionate. Um, but if you are connecting with people, please, please, please keep it short. They will so appreciate it. I don't want to speak on behalf of everybody in television, but certainly I do. Um, I do this as well, believe it or not, when I'm emailing or texting or DMing or whatever it might be. Whenever I'm sending communication to my colleagues, I edit, edit, edit. I write down what I'm saying, what I want to say. Uh, I look, look back at it. I cut out all of the waffle um, and I get so many sort of posts or emails from people that are so long winded, you know, their whole backstory, you know, sometimes the ask is right at the end of the, the email, put it right up front, what you're looking for, why you're contacting them and why, um, reread those emails and edit, edit, edit before you send it. I know it sounds obvious, but it does, it does make a difference. Um, keep it personal. Don't do a round robin, no cut and pasting. You've got to be speaking directly to the person that you're sending it to. So that also means don't send a huge list, the same email to absolutely everybody. Definitely don't put it on a you know, CC for everybody. Um, and if you get a reply, don't reply all. Everybody hates that. Thank you. Um, the other area that I want to mention is uh, be prepared. So I'm going to name drop just once um, because this is a really, really good piece of advice. But I was doing a show with Oprah Winfrey. And she would always say, as we were going into a meeting or just before we were about to roll, before we were about to meet someone new, she would like put her arm around my shoulder and she would lean in um, and she would say, Rob, what is your intention for this meeting? What do you want to get out of this, re this interaction? If it was a, a meeting, what was the end goal? If it's an interview, what are you trying to draw out from this person? What are we here for? Um, and so I always think that that's a really good way to start a new project, to start a conversation before you're going to go meet somebody. State what the end goal is to yourself. Um, and then when you go in, you can start those meetings with this is what I want and why. And then everybody's on the same page with what the end goal is. Um, and I also I often feel that people then feel good about helping you achieve that goal. 
so everybody can come out you know it's like you know what i can actually help that person get what it is that they want um and if you've said that up front then it's pretty easy for me to do um then why not do it and we all feel good about ourselves so it's let it's worth letting people know ahead of time what your intention is um i always think that good leaders are very goal orientated you know it's the easiest way to kind of check yourself check yourself to show you know your productivity or how successful this thing is going going to be and then you can kind of look back and see whether you've achieved it or not so it's a really good way to kind of gauge how things are going you also can't just get in the room get the meeting um, and then expect the other person to do all of the work you might be super nervous but you have to be prepared um, but you know, you're there because you've asked to be there or you've asked to have the conversation. If even if you're walking up to somebody at a party, you can't just say, I want to work with you or I love what you do or how did you get to where you want to be and then stop and expect the other person to pick up the conversation. You know, you are the protagonist in this story, right? So you do need to continue to lead the conversation. You've got to have a point of view for your, uh, for your plan of action or your conversation. Um, just quick note about reading the room. Um, you know, some people appreciate the tenacity of constantly, you know, knocking on the door. You know, it's great to not hear no and, and to bang on until you get a yes. Um, so a little nudge or a little reminder if you don't hear from people is absolutely fine because that email has gone to the bottom of my, you know, sort of emails, you know, every, every 24 hours. So I always think that a quick nudge or a reminder every two weeks is totally acceptable and shows that you're serious and anything more than that, uh, you're bugging me. And so that's gonna be annoying and I'm gonna to want to avoid that. So people don't like to be sort of nagged about something. Um, and if you've really not heard from somebody after like a month or six weeks or so, have some self-respect, they're not worth contacting, move on. There's always somebody else that can get you what you need. Um, so they're not worth connecting with. So if you really don't hear from people for that long, give it up and, and try a different angle. Um, and then when you do get in the room, a couple of quick don'ts. Don't acknowledge that finally they've replied to you because um, that just makes people feel bad and, and that's awkward. Nobody likes the confrontation. So you don't need like a negative atmosphere. That's in the past. You're in the room now. You're having the conversation now. So use the time to get what it is that you, that, you, know, you, you contacted them for in the first place. What are you going to do with your time once you've got it? You don't need to complain about how long it took you to get there. So make it productive. Um, and then afterwards, whatever your interaction is, I always think a really quick, short uh, thank you for meeting just ties it all up nicely. So not a, again, not a big, long you know, communication, but a, a quick thanks for your time. So another thing I want to mention is who do you know? Uh, sort of 75% or so of jobs are always referrals. You know, once you've been in the business a while, you do get calls about things, which is great. Um, it's not just your experience, though, that gets you the job. It's who you are as a person. And when you're so singularly minded about what you want, I know, to, you know that's also uh, commendable, but doesn't show you as a well-rounded, fully rounded person. I think your personality really does matter. People want to work with nice people, especially in this day and age. So be easy to work with, be professional, which means all of the stuff we just talked about, being prepared. Um, don't get stressed, you know, of course we all get stressed. Don't show how stressed you are, keep it all in. Go complain about it to your, you know, your friend, your girlfriend, your roommate, your brother, your husband, whatever it is afterwards. Don't be a shouter at work. Nobody likes that, uh, especially right now. That is just not a culture that we appreciate anymore. Um, it's not impressive. Um, and put people first. And it is a people business. It's a relationship business. If you do that, people will say not only as is, is the person organized, but they're really nice to be around. And that's the atmosphere that I want on my project. Once you've got the job, it ain't over. You know, I have to prove myself, you know, I'm it's first day at school, every new show I do, even if I'm the network exec, you know, uh, it's constantly, it never, never ends, you know, the proving of why you were there to, to, to get in the room. Um, it's just about not being complacent, I guess. Um, you know, your experience gets you there, but it doesn't get you, get you through the job. It just gets you in the room. So you always have to be, uh, you know, on top of, uh, of things from, you know, there's, there's never a chance to kind of give up and sit back and relax. Um, and then the final piece of advice that I want to say is, you know, you do deserve to get what you want. You've trained for it. You've worked hard. You know, you can have belief in yourself 
you know, if you want it, it is there for you. You just have to know the tricks of the trade to get to it. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have a, a plan for your career. You know, careers are long. You know, you could be working for 40 plus years in this industry. Um, I'd, I'm not doing now exactly what I wanted to do when I was 20. I had no idea that I would have the sort of career I would have. And I don't think anybody would say that. So don't be in a mad rush to get the perfect job. There is no such thing as the perfect job. Um, you need to plan for those meetings, but you don't necessarily need to plan your career path because you're going to miss out on some opportunities that would give you some other contacts, give you other experience, find something else that you might like. You know, you're going to make mistakes this way, but that's how we all learn. So you will arrive at the right path for you if you are open to any opportunity. So even if it's not exactly what you want, if it's not number four on your step to career success, take it anyway, try it. Um, the first few years of your career, you're going to be trying different things to figure out what you're good at, what you like anyway. So don't be afraid to say yes. Um, you deserve a seat at the table. Um, if you're polite and respectful, but tenacious to get there, then it will happen for you. So that's my kind of positive end, I hope, to, to my little speech. I'm going to hand it back to Andrew and, and open it up to the, to the panel to see if they agree or disagree. That's just how I got to where I was. So uh, thanks for listening. And Andrew, back to you. Thank you so much, Rob. Fascinating uh, insights there and some really great advice that hopefully uh, will be really useful to, uh, to everybody uh, watching and listening uh, this evening. Um, so uh, we're now going to uh, move on to, uh, to the Q&A section of uh, this evening and uh, your opportunity to ask some questions uh, to Rob. Um, and to ensure you get the most out of this session, we wanted to include a range of voices on the panel. Uh, to demonstrate the many views and routes into this industry. So we've invited uh, Hanan and Nick, who are two recent graduates doing really well in uh, the media industry, and also Paula from our career service uh, to say a few words to you, and also, they'll also be answering your questions as well. Um, so Hanan, can I ask you uh, to uh, just say a few words, please, first about um, what you studied and your career so far? Uh, thank you for allowing me to join this event and thank you Rob, for this uh, uh, speech. I'm Hanan Youssef. I am an Egyptian independent documentary film producer and director. I am uh, also a former university lecturer and a documentary filmmaking trainer. Um, I have, uh, I'm Chibling alumna and I have studied uh, media production, television documentary production at the University of Salford. I graduated in 2017. And it's worth mentioning that uh, my graduation project to the town The Man Left won a BBC's Best Short Documentary Film Award at BBC Arabic Festival 2018. Uh, my latest documentary film, Sabek, uh, it was commissioned by BBC and broadcast on BBC Arabic television channel. And recently, I'm a One Word Media Fellow and I am in the pre production stage of my new documentary film. Fantastic. Thank you, Hanan. And you're joining us from uh, Alexandria uh, yes. this evening. So thank you very much indeed. Um, Nick, you're working for BBC Sport. Tell us about what you studied at Salford and how you got your job at uh, the BBC. Yeah, so I studied uh, TV and radio uh, at Salford or in Salford, uh, uh, graduating at the end of 28 or kind of the middle of 2018. Um, and it took about four months to find my first uh, kind of job, really. And yeah, brutal, brutal few months, but um, managed to get my foot in the door at uh, Children Need. Um, and then through a result of just, as, as Rob was mentioning, kind of contacts and, and put my name out there, uh, worked at Radio Manchester for a while and then kind of moved around the BBC on different contracts. Uh, the question of sport was one, bite size was another. Um, and then the pandemic hit um, and then I was kind of, through no one's fault, just kind of forced out of the BBC. My contract came to an end and did some other stuff for uh, kind of Channel 4 documentaries. So that was with other independent production company. Uh, but yeah, now I'm back at the BBC. Uh, working on the uh, summer of sport that's going on, so Wimbledon, uh, the Olympics. Uh, obviously, there was the um, the stuff as well with the uh, the hundred that's coming on now. So yeah, lots of different things going on, um, and yeah, I'm just about to start on the Olympics tomorrow night. So um, I'm officially on Tokyo time now. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nick uh, and Paula. Finally, if you could just say a few words about what you and the career service uh, can offer to our uh, students and also to our graduates. Yeah, of course. So 
we offer, um, I suppose it's first worthwhile just saying that our service is actually a lifetime offer. So as long as students have graduated from Salford, you can actually access our careers and enterprise team um, indefinitely. So as much as needed. The sorts of things that we do at the moment is uh, heavily focused on one-to-one -one support for our students and our graduates and alumni. And that is within, we've got careers advisors like myself, and we've also got enterprise advisors. And the sorts of things that we would do is one-to-ones around graduate options, job hunting, mock interviews, uh, CVs, interview skills, and then the enterprise team, they would focus on things like pitching skills, um, business planning, models, market research, so all, you know, a wide range of things related to working for yourself. So those are the one-to-one -one bookable appointments that students and alumni and graduates can access. As well as that, we also do a lot of live masterclasses which I will put the links to this in the chat for people if they want to access these. But the live masterclasses are on very similar subjects to what I've just mentioned. Um, so career planning, CV, uh, writing, business planning, that type of thing. So they're all live, a bit like this, you know, on our internal collaborate um, platform where you can actually interact with members of staff and ask questions and, and things like that. So lots of things going on um, like that, but we also do have lots of LinkedIn learning available, which is on our student hub page, which we've got around, I think there's over 35 titles there of short bite-sized courses, all related to careers and enterprise, which would be really helpful for students. Um, so that's just a quick summary of the sorts of things that we do. Thank you very much, Paula. Okay, let's uh, get straight on to your questions. And don't forget, uh, you can ask uh, questions of Rob and the rest of the panel. Um, just type your question into the Q&A box and we will uh, try and get to, uh, to all of them uh, if we can. Um, so let's start with uh, a question from Laura. Um, Rob, do you feel that you have to move out of the UK to progress your career? You've obviously done that yourself. Uh, and we'll ask you, Hanan, to, to come in on this as well once uh, Rob's spoken. But, yeah, do you feel you have to leave the UK to, to, to get ahead in, in TV? No, not at all. It was uh, an opportunity that arose and was super exciting. It wasn't something that I was planning or even, even out of necessity. You know, I was working in development for a production company that was doing everything from Challenge Amica to Question Time. Um, and uh, Britain's Worst Driver, you know, so we were doing a lot of uh, content for the UK for lots of different channels. Um, and, you know, it was at a, a period in the early 2000s where reality competition shows were exploding all over the world and one format was going worldwide, be it um, Millionaire, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire or The Weakest Link, you know, they, and beginnings of I'm a Celebrity were getting out there. So British producers were going to the States to sell, to get the big network gig. Um, and so, because I was working in development at the time, we had this idea for a competition. Panel four were interested, but we also had a contact at Fox in America. And so that's why I went to pitch. I wasn't planning to leave the UK for lack of opportunities within the UK. It was just an opportunity that arose somewhere else. So it's all, it's so by luck, all of it. Like, like I said, it's really hard to design your career like step 20 in three years time, I'm gonna be doing this. It just doesn't work you know, that way. Um, I think now with certainly with the explosion of all of these other buyers and, and different platforms and streaming, you can make content anywhere for any buyer around the world you know especially in the last two years we've been making content from our bedrooms for network television you know it is possible it doesn't matter where you are um you can reach out you know there are ways of connecting with people you know ar around the globe um i'm not sure i could be back in the uk you know producing content because i just don't know the culture as well having been away for so many years so you know and you know, I think Hannah has a probably a different perspective because the type of story she's telling in nonfiction documentary are, are specific to a culture. So you might have to go somewhere for that reason. Um, but maybe Nick has a has a better idea because you've worked freelance, right, Nick, for years in the UK and still working. Um, mm. So I'm not sure what the, the climate is, climate yeah, is there now. Yeah, I mean, 100. percent It's it's uh, an, you know an industry, especially that's becoming a lot more London centric. And I think wherever you are in in the UK, uh, there's there's opportunity to be involved in media production. Obviously, more so in Manchester and and London. Um, and I was want to say that when I left university, that Manchester is, is the place where I need to stay if I want to to really um, get my career started. But yeah, you can you can develop it anywhere. But I think yeah, it's it's an industry that is you know 
initially, you know, London has so many opportunities, but I think in the regions, you've got uh, radio stations, you've got newspaper, newspapers, digital websites. There's so media is so encompassing that it's at the very fabric of our of our UK uh, life, I guess. So, so yeah, I, I really wouldn't worry about um, finding work in in wherever you are. But obviously, London and Manchester are, are going to be the best options. And Hanan, you moved back to Egypt, didn't you, after yes, uh, studying at Salford? Yeah, well, I'd like to add that uh, I got my foot in industry during my year at the UK, as I told you, during my graduation project. Uh, I worked on this project along with my supervisors, and I spent like uh, months working on this. And uh, hopefully I submitted this first, uh, submitted my film to a BBC Arabic Documentary Festival in London. And this is where I formed my network with filmmakers, with uh, potential commissioners and with uh, uh, executive producers. And this is actually how I started working uh, on my next film, Sabic, and how I uh, connected with the executive producer from BBC in London. And we started working the movie. So for me, now in the UK, there are a lot of opportunities, there are a lot of uh, festivals to attend where you can meet uh, 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 filmmakers and uh, potential commissioners, also uh, fellowships and platforms to meet in person with filmmakers and uh, potential commissioners. So, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Okay, uh, here's another one from uh, Michael, who is working at uh, the BBC, uh, BBC Studios as a researcher. Uh, so, Michael, you've obviously got into uh, to the BBC already, so well done. Uh, this is to you, Rob. Uh, 25 years ago, linear TV was king. Now it's battling with YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, TVOD, and everything else online for viewers' time and money. If you were starting out now, would you still be setting your sights as firmly on TV? or taking your production ambitions elsewhere? That's a really good question. Um, often, you know, I, I think now people are referring to the term that content is king, whereas back in the day, it might have been television was the end goal or was the jewel in the crown of, of media production. Um, but now content comes in so many different forms, can even come in a, a, a two minute you know, TikTok. Um, and short form storytelling is as important as, as long form storytelling, theatrical feature length, you know, all, all kinds of sort of buyers and platforms. So it has totally broke, you know, the, totally broken the mold. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, in the last two years, 18 months or so, where we've been forced to be, you know, fractured and, and streaming has really taken advantage of that situation with so many, you know, of our demo and audience at home. Um, it's anybody's game. So no, I wouldn't look at television as the be all and end all now. In fact, that's why we changed the title or we, we made the title of this conversation, television and beyond. For a lot of big brands though, from the BBC to, um, to where I am in, in the States right now at Nickelodeon, you know, these are brands, uh, uh, but the linear channel, the network television channel, is still where a lot of advertisers uh, come to play. And that's where we get our you know, we, we, we get our, our uh, dollars to make our shows. So it, it, it does still come back to linear television. Um, in the States, for example, I work for a parent company, Viacom, which is a very big, you know, old dusty corporate company that has a lot of networks, you know, underneath them, Nickelodeon being one, but we just launched Paramount Plus which is you know, another streaming platform, all the content from MTV, VH1, country music television, uh, CBS, Nickelodeon, all go to Paramount Plus. And they're actually pulling, this is public knowledge, you know, they're pulling premiere shows on television to, pre in, in, they were greenlit to premiere on linear television. They're now premiering on the streaming service. And I'm sure you've seen, you know, Warner Brothers are doing the same with theatrical movies, you know, $200 million budget, plus movies now premiering on the streaming platform. So everyone is waking up to the fact that the audience, you know, is getting their consuming their content, you know, on, on different platforms. And we have to, as uh, developers of new content, have to acknowledge that. So TV is not the first stop anymore, but it is often the linchpin of where all of the other material for an idea spins off from. Thanks, Robin. And Nick, of course, that's where you're finding work, isn't it? Um, working for a you know, traditionally BBC mm. big TV corporation, but but you're actually providing digital content. Yeah, I mean that that's it. And, and broadcasters like the BBC are all about young audiences now, and they want to meet people who can use TikTok and and various things. And that's 
that's something that you've just got to, um, you know, it's important, important to kind of send, you know, work out what your USP is, I guess, and and then you know work out what your strengths and weaknesses are, and kind of sell yourself on that, I guess. And that's that's what I said in, in a lot of interviews. Was you know, I grew up uh, making digital content on YouTube and social media, and and these are skills that are required. So yeah, it's kind of working out what what you're good at, and then and then kind of selling yourself on that. But um, yeah, it's a great place to be. And obviously, the BBC are doing so much around digital. Cool. Can I can I just add to that? Nick, Nick's absolutely right, but it just reminded me when you, when you if you are a creator, whatever you refer to that term as, if you have a project that you're passionate about that you want to get sold or you want to make yourself or what, whatever it is, it's really worth thinking about the audience for that show or that idea. You know, it's you, you have a great story, you have a great concept, whatever the idea is, you know you can't just go to all 100 potential buyers. You know, maybe you do and maybe you tweak the idea a little bit so it's appropriate for them. But thinking about who the audience is is just as important about thinking what the story is. Um, and there may be ideas that lend themselves better to short form. Therefore, this is a limited series on TikTok or, or this is actually a snap show um, or it is a huge 360 idea and we have a linear network television series and off the back of that we have auxiliary programming that then lives on you know bbc3 or, or on the you know the red button platform or whatever it is so you, you know it's worth going into a conversation with a potential buyer knowing who you think the best audience is for it and, and it also helps you decide the best platform as well Thanks, everybody, for those uh, answers. Um, Abby uh, asks, what's the best way to get an idea in front of a network? Um, and in terms of how you pitch it, um, one sheet, pilot script, what's the best way of, of pitching it? Rob, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I get pitches in the coffee shop. In the, in the bar, in uh, my friends, you know, babysitting for my friend, you know, just absolutely everywhere. Look, a good idea can come from anywhere. It's just knowing the right place to, to do it. When it comes to contacting a traditional buyer, you know, it, it goes back to the right show in the right time for the right audience. So let's say you have a great singing competition. You might want to go to a production company that is known for that. Uh, rather than a small boutique, you know, company that do a lot of non-scripted, you know, documentary programming, because the buyer, you know, knows that they have a certain amount of money um, and, you know, everybody is risk averse. So you're trying to pack your idea or your project with as many, you know, checks or ticks in the boxes as, as possible. Um, and, a, and a documentary company coming in and pitching a singing show uh, ain't going to be as well received as, uh, as somebody who has that sort of track record. So, Sometimes it's worth pairing with partners who do have experience in the genre uh, that you're most interested in. Uh, in other words, a tried and tested producer, talent, on screen or off, uh, production company, uh, and then going to a buyer so that you're presenting a fully rounded you know, package. That's not to say you have to attach talent to an idea because often the buyer has their own deals or their own thoughts on that. Um, but again, it's just pairing with the right people you know, because a great idea with the wrong person makes a bad show, you know, and vice versa is true. So in terms of physically what it is, though, you don't have to spend a lot of money uh, on bells and whistles producing a fancy sizzle or a, um, a full, fully fledged pilot. Everybody knows that's not going to be the end result, you know, and I think really experienced buyers uh, are used to seeing through that. So tape is always better than paper, but it still can be a very basic uh, sort of visualization or realization of, of what you're intending to do. Don't spend a lot of time and money on the production values of that because they're gonna change it anyway. The idea is what's important. Uh, and that's the thing that you should spend your time and money on is thinking through the right idea, not presenting it in the most polished possible way, I think. A couple of uh, quite similar questions. So I'll ask these together. Uh, Abby, uh, sorry, uh, Karen um, worked in the industry at BBC and Granada TV straight from studying in Salford University. Um, but uh, Karen's been out of the industry for 20 years. Do you have any tips for getting back into the industry at a later age? And Lily uh, also asks, how would a middle-aged female writer starting out in TV go about breaking into the business? So how about those uh, alumni who perhaps... Um, 
not been working in television or been out of the industry for some time? What, what's their best approach? I'll just say real, just real quick, um, like transferable skills never go away. Um, it might be a different uh, industry, might be a different landscape, but you can still write, you can still produce, you can still tell a story. You have to do the background to figure out the language of the day. Um, I had to do that, you know, with the advent of social media, I had to do it with the advent of streamers, you know, the, the, the communication is different, but it all comes back to a great idea. And, you know, if you've got experience, then you can do that. So it's, you know, the people are different, you know, especially in my world with, with buyers, you know, network execs or commissioners, channel commissioners, right, Nick? That's what they're called now, right? Yep. <laughs> so, um, so, um, yeah, you see, like you even even five minutes out, and it and it's a different world. So you you have to learn, you know, who who is in the in the chair now, um, but the skills that you had back in the day haven't gone away. You know, you just you just knock those off. You know, it just it just comes back to a, a good idea. I think that the the rules of of connecting with people are the same, you know, from twenty years ago as they are now. It all comes down to respecting people's time and being being prepared. You know, if you have a good idea that's right for the audience now, people will listen to you whether you've been in the business for five minutes or 50 years. I don't think that matters. And Paula, there's help available for, as you said, for uh, alumni, um, no matter how long they've um, it is, has been since they've graduated. Uh, if they need any help, perhaps polishing their CV or with the interview skills. Yeah, I was just going to put my hand up then. So just add to that really what Rob was saying, that I think it is about doing that assessment of your skills and thinking about what you've developed in your life experience and how you can then bring that to your new role. Um, but yeah, I think there's also a lot to be said for the things that Rob's talked about in relation to your networking and maybe starting to build up that, that network now, you know, trying to get your name out there and maybe promoting yourself and doing a lot of personal marketing, particularly on platforms like LinkedIn, you know, getting your name known a little bit so that you can advertise yourself. Um, but yeah, definitely there is lots of support that we can offer to students and obviously to our alumni as well. With regards to CVs, yeah, we can do CV reviews. We've got um, an artificial intelligence program now that can scan CVs and give um, instant feedback to um, on the CV. Um, and we can also do that with things like LinkedIn. So if people wanted to you know, have that bit of support to run through the profile and think about how they can sell themselves the best and make sure that they're marketing themselves in the right way, then again, that's, that's support that we can offer. Thanks, Paula. Um, Claire asks, uh, do any of you have advice on how to make sure your eagerness is not being taken advantage of pay-wise? Uh, so Claire's got a job coming up in London, confident it's underpaying by a fair bit, but says she feels silly turning an opportunity like that down. So what's, what's the best approach to that? And, and Nick and uh, Hanan, um, as recent graduates yourselves, um, have you been in that situation where you've been trying to get work and you've been thinking, you know, is it really worth my while doing this? I'm not going to pay, pay very much for it. It's, it's a tricky one. I mean, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, there, there is a culture and I'm sure Rob will agree with this, that, you know, there are some things in TV that need to need to change and improve, but I think there is an element of this industry because it's a creative industry. You've, you've almost got to put a little bit of your own time in uh, to kind of, um, you know, invest in, in that future. Um, I think whether if that's going on any more than, I don't know, three months, six months or something, then you're probably not in the right place and you need to look elsewhere. But yeah, I think it's a, it's a delicate balance between making sure that you're showing your passion, but also, yeah, not, not being taken advantage of. But I think, as Rob will agree, there's a lot of um, action being taken in the industry to make everywhere a bit more, um, you know, a, a bit more suitable to, to everyone um, and to make sure that the culture is right. Um, so, so yeah, um, it, it's a kind of balance on that one. I would, I would say, I would add to that. I agree with Nick. I would add to that. If you're, if you're in an environment where they are not willing to have that conversation, then that is not a place that deserves your time, skill, talent, and hard work. So it is a balance. You do have to, uh, you know, put your time in. You know, I, I did so much work experience that was unpaid when I started, but it was my choice, uh, and the opportunity was there. Excuse me, and I think now you know there are very, very serious work experience or internship contracts, the most of which are paid, um, and if not, as Nick said, they you know they are short time. So you have to put your time in, but know your value, and, and when it's time uh, to speak up, then you deserve to be heard. And if you're not being heard, then that's not a place that deserves you in the first place. Yeah, 
Okay, thanks. Um, Hannah, did you want to add anything to that? Yes, I'd like to yeah. say that from my personal experience, like maybe at the first time when I worked with uh, institutions, it depends, uh, it doesn't depend completely on the institution, but maybe when I was working first with BBC, the executive producer had standard dates, which I accepted at first. And from my point of view, I felt that uh, my work is going to be too much for this uh, pet amount of money. However, when I proved myself and I, when I worked hard, planned everything and showed her that I can do this job and I'm the perfect one to do this job, yes. She amended my uh, rate and then I got better rate. So it depends on how are you going to prove that you fit this uh, particular job, from my point of view. Okay. That's a really, I'd, I'd say, Hannah, that's a, that's a really good point. It's, pr it's proving yourself a little bit. You've got to be in the room for a while to show the contribution that you can make to then justify saying, and I want a full-time job that is compensated financially and appropriately for this. You can't expect that on day one, but you can certainly expect that on day 30. Right? Yeah, I think that is proving yourself. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Question from Daniel, uh, who graduated last year. Uh, Daniel says, fellow graduates are working for Apple TV, Disney, Netflix, great to see. Uh, but Daniel says, I'm struggling myself to break into the TV film industry as a director. Should I focus on making things and getting representation or chase shadowing opportunities and work my way up? Who wants to take who yeah. wants to take that uh, one? Nick, what, what do you think? Yeah, I, I'd, I'd say um, it's it's a it's an interesting one because, to be honest, I I, I pitched an idea to um, a, a broadcaster recently, and I I, I basically wrote to a um, an a independent production company and teamed up with them. Um, so I think it's it's a it's a it's a, a balance between um, yeah getting making sure that you have your own uh, thoughts on on your piece and 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 making it. But from from my perspective of, of pitching something myself, I think. It's it's always uh, probably easier to you know to pitch things with ideas rather than pitch things with I mean obviously you, you might end up making a taster tape if they like it but to, to to make something and then say do you like it is, is a little bit long winded I would, I would say and I'm sure Rob will have have thoughts on that. Well, I I agree with um, with shadowing, but maybe it's the way that you psychologically approach it yourself, right? I mean something that we haven't talked about and this is so for another conversation, but the whole you know. So the mental wellness that comes with being or the challenges of mental wellness that comes with being in a freelance industry, especially one that's changing as much as media is, is a is a real challenge. And so you sort of have to be super strong yourself in what you're willing to accept uh, and, and when it's time to move on, when it's time to ask for money, whatever it, it might be. And so sometimes it's changing your own mindset to an opportunity. So work experience or shadowing. You know, you might think, well, is this is this useful because it's a contact or is this a waste of my time because I'm not being paid? But in those situations, I've always seen it as it's my choice and therefore it's it's free education, you know, for lack of a, a better term. I'm sure there's a sexier way of saying it, but it's like I choose to be here and I'm going to get something out of it. It's almost like having, you know, that that sort of unpaid internship or that access to the world that you're interested in. You know, rather than begrudging it, uh, I, you know, I think it's useful just to kind of change your, your mental approach to it and say, actually, this is helping me get to the step that I, that I want to get to. So I, I choose to pay myself to be here in this situation for, for a, a period of time. And Rob, you mentioned um, in your talk that you, you got yourself an agent um, at one point in your career. And uh, Dan's asking if the best approach um, at the start of your career is, is to pitch an idea yourself for a TV show or to get an agent and go through a, a production company, to, to, uh, sorry, to go through an agent um, to get them to, to pitch it for you. In the States, representation is kind of everything until you get to a stage where people are coming to you. But the short answer I would say is for the UK is you don't need representation for yourself, whatever, whether it's your a cinematographer, filmmaker, writer, actor, whatever it might be. But if you have an idea that you are trying to sell to a buyer, then representation is really helpful because they will help package it with um, those other people in the group that you need to help sell a fully rounded idea. And also buyers are very reticent or hesitant to take an idea from 
just one freelancer, whether they have a track record, track record or not, generally there's a, a production company or someone more experienced attached to an idea. So it's legally, and it helps you as much as them, um, the safest way of, of bringing an idea to a potential buyer. So if it's a project, representation, if it's you, no, you can sell yourself. We are running a little short of time, but I will try and get a couple more questions in, uh, if that's okay. So here is a question from somebody who has been working as a runner uh, or has approached to work as a runner by production companies, done this over a number of years, don't seem to progress any further. I recently asked a talent manager for any other roles such as researcher, and they told me I don't have enough experience. So it's this dilemma, isn't it? How do you get the experience that you need to get the job that you want? Um, so how can I progress to the next level or assert myself without coming across in the wrong way. I, I, I think I can I can reference this um, having jumped from researcher uh, runner to researcher over the last last few years, and I think it is a bit of um, a bit of luck and a bit of um, yeah, bit of help along along the way from um, from fate, I guess. But then there is a lot of it that, that comes from your um, yourself, and I think we, we talk about you know having not, not having enough experience to jump up the level, but I think. Um, it is just re meeting the right person sometimes. And um, the reason I became a runner was because, <laughs> I'll be honest, um, everyone else uh, pulled out of the application process. So sometimes it is just a bit of, uh, yeah, a bit of luck along the way. But um, as I say, if you want it bad enough, I think I think you'll get that, you know, and that's, that's it sounds like you're doing the right things. I'd just add as well to that, um, Andrew, that I think what's really important at the moment is that resilience, isn't it? And just being able to pick yourself up and, and keep going. And, and potentially if you're in that position where it's, it's been for a while and you're looking for the opportunities, it's about trying to have that confidence in your own ability and to really put yourself forward for, for different opportunities and, and keep having that perseverance as well. I think that's really important. Okay. I, would, I, agree, I agree with that as well. It's, it's being proactive. Um, so you're already in the room. You know, you're already you know, on the production, you know, you're, you're running. It's the hardest job on the show um, or, the, or the project. Um, but there is a little bit of downtime sometimes in that. And you're already there. So help out as much as possible. And you need to if, if they're not willing to see it, you need to show them until they are. So I was a, I was a runner. And, you know, in between all of my running gigs and getting the lunch that I can still remember the exact menu of the host's lunch that when I was a runner, um, you know, I was sitting with the researchers, I was listening, I was helping out, I was running and grabbing that book when they suggested something. So I was sort of doing the job within the job I was currently doing. Um, and then Nick said, it's total opportunity. So when there was a position available, they were like, well, Rob's kind of doing that already within his other gigs. So let's just, you know, give him the opportunity. So you, you sort of have to find your moments and, and be proactive about it. Yeah. Um, Question from uh, Gabrielle, who has uh, a fantastic uh, job, skateboard coach and content creator. Um, wow. Uh, so Gabrielle asks, um, so, so Gabrielle, I beg your pardon, Gabrielle asks, uh, since the pandemic, there's been a huge shift in the way that the industry operates. Do you think that the industry will have changed permanently because of this? And I wonder if that's something that people should be taking account of as they're trying to, to get into the industry. Rob, what, what do you think, first of all? Yeah, sorry, I never want to jump in first. Um, yeah, I think cult yes, culturally and also economically, um, the events of the last two years have absolutely changed our industry for um, you know per you know permanently. So it still comes back to a good idea. You know, it doesn't mean we all have to make you know super serious you know doom and gloom you know stories. Escapism uh, and entertainment is extremely valuable. Um, and, you know, hitting those cultural sort of zeitgeist, you know, moments within a fictional or a non-fictional story are still going to be of value. But the way that they are presented and certainly financially the way that they are packaged will change. Um, but it just comes back to having a, a good idea. You just have to look at, you know, the, the, the similar content that's being bought at the time and the method uh, for which it's, it's being bought, you know, in the not to get into the weeds about economy, but in the U US, you know, creators don't own their content, whereas in the UK, you generally retain your copyright. Um, there's all kinds of distribution deals and you can make money on that once your project is successful. Um, but, but sometimes, you know, the, the, the person creating the content feels that its success is out of their control. 
but actually it's it's really not if you have the idea you are the person in the you know in in the hot seat and you can decide what to do with that idea and and it has worth therefore you have worth so you, it still comes back to you know having a, a great idea and then we'll figure it out just the days of multi you know pound you know projects uh, sort of a, a long gone but the the good aspect of this is that there are you know quadruple the number of potential buyers and potential platforms for an audience so just getting your idea out there sometimes is more important than getting the best deal at least in the beginning that's that's what i think um a final question uh from emily and this goes to all of you uh, what do you think are the most important qualities attitudes and actions for people in the in industry to have or to take so maybe if i could ask each of you to give me one really important quality, attitude or action uh, that you would suggest people should be thinking about as they, uh, as they look for work or as they try and progress their careers. Yeah. Nick, do you want to start us off? Sorry, yeah. Hannah. Cool. <laughs> Go on, Nick. Oh, I'm going. Okay. Um, so yeah, um, I, I kind of mentioned them kind of briefly throughout uh, you know, the, the last half hour, but I think as I say, the three things I'd kind of narrow it down to is kind of having a USP, that passion, um, and also kind of strengths and weaknesses. And um, I think the most critical thing to be aware of these days is, um, as, as we spoke about earlier into, uh, to, with Robert, kind of around cultural practices. And I think diversity is such an important part of, of media. So being aware of that and creating diverse ideas um, and being aware of diverse audiences is, is really important. And, and that's something I do uh, myself with uh, kind of neurodiversity and that's something I'm really passionate about. But yeah, so I think an awareness, is that, awareness of that is really important uh, these days. But as I say, kind of USP passion and, and, and knowing kind of what you're about, your strengths and weaknesses is the most critical thing. Hello. From my point of view, I see that uh, taking good relationships with everyone you work with is something that helps you not only to expand your network, but to retain it. For instance, with commissioners, I have to be punctual, I have to be planned, and I have to do my best to prove myself, as I said, because uh, it, it works by recommendation. If a commissioner is happy with me, he's gonna recommend me to another one. So things work on like this. Also, if I'm working with a crew, so I need to take good care of the crew and I need to give them the uh, rights fairly. And I have to make like a two way communication process with me and them, listen to their feedback because this is very important because crew go and speak to and everything is built, is built on reputation in this field. Uh, one last thing is taking good care of my contributors and making sure that, you know, because when I found them, there is an eternal bond between me and them. So uh, being considerate to the ethical responsibility for me towards them is very important from my own point of view. Yeah, really important point. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Hanan. Uh, Paula, what would you say are the most important um, qualities, attributes, actions? Yeah, so I think um, a lot of this we've touched on already, but having that confidence, backing yourself as much as possible and putting yourself in situations that are uncomfortable and potentially scary. So, you know, not being afraid to actually step up and, and try new things and put yourself in uh, different scenarios. So I think that's really important. But then also having that ability to do that self-analysis of your skills. So understanding what they are so that then when you are putting yourself forward for opportunities, you can articulate that in a, in a way that's actually selling yourself and you, you know you can demonstrate what you can bring to a particular role so I think that's really important um, but also what I've found recently with with students is, is talking to them a lot about being aware of um, the market that you're going into and the competitors and things like that is really important and particularly when you you know you, you go in for interviews and things like that it's useful to have that commercial awareness which I think is a, a key skill of, of for students these days. Thank you Paula and finally Rob. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, I agree with all of these. Like Nick's, you know, USP, passion, totally agree. Paul, you know, knowing the workplace, knowing your experience. But I'm going to echo what Hanan said. And the word that I would reference is respect. So respect the person, respect the institution that you are going to, respect their time, respect their experience, uh, but also respect your idea. You know, understand its value um, and do right by your project, do right by your idea or, or the career that you want um, and don't settle. 
um, and don't just accept something um, just for the sake of getting your foot in the door. If you feel it's not right for your idea, then stick to your guns. And then finally, respect yourself, you know, know your worth, you know, and if you do that respectfully, um, not only is it good kind of life skills, uh, you know, and it's how we communicate, you know, with each other, but people do notice uh, and pick up on that. And if you respect the person you're talking to, respect the idea that you have and respect yourself and do right by those three things, then I hope and I think that you will be successful. So it will come. Thank you, Rob. And thanks to all of our panel. And that concludes our event for this evening. Uh, so I'd really like to thank Rob, Hanan, Nick and Paula for answering uh, those questions. Hope you've gained an insight into the industry uh, and hopefully it's given you plenty of inspiration to forge your own way. Thank you uh, to you too for joining us this evening and for your comments and questions. Don't forget you can network with a range of Salford graduates working in all industries in all corners of the globe on our online alumni hub from Salford.com. So don't be afraid to reach out. You never know where it might lead you. Thanks very much for joining us. Have a good night. Bye-bye.